Would I like you also to take a basic because we are going to continue the rest of the session? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. about Flanders actually because uh, we are confident with quite some people here that have helped in the preparation that what we are doing in Flanders can actually serve also as a very good practice of what also could be presented in your countries. I think it's uh, good in European projects and European initiatives that we can learn from each other. I think it was very good. However, this is an event about European projects. So what would be this event without presenting the actual project? So it's what we're going to do in the next uh, one hour, one hour and a half. Um, we will start uh, with uh, three integrated presentations, uh, namely the VP, the mentoring, and, um, and the DICE project. Oh, yes, in front of me. Um, we're going to co-present it with uh, David. And all the other presentations, I would kindly ask, for either Jan, Maria, or Panayoti, and, uh, and uh, it's Constantino, Constantino, okay, just to be very awake, so by the time it has presented. <laughs> Good. VP mentoring and dies, they have quite some things in common, okay? That's the first thing that uh, I will uh, address. <coughs> now, uh, could someone put out the light on the right, uh, right side, the extreme light? Small button, thank you very much. So we can see a little bit about this uh, page. Um, four or five years ago, we were sitting together with a number of end user organizations throughout Europe. Founders, uh, Greece, yeah, from Greece we, had, uh, we were sitting there with the people from uh, this group now, Bulgaria. In England, also with David, with uh, David, Mr. David Stewart. And we looked at what were the, the gaps that we saw there were in society and that hampered people from, with disabilities to actually be empowered, to actually what they wanted to do, that they could uh, also have an independent life. <coughs> there were a number of things that popped up. 
One of the things that we heard, for example, from the, the Flemish team was, it's all good they talk about integration computers and etc., but they cannot even switch on the computer. There is no appropriate training to teach people with disabilities how to use a computer. The general approach is in was in Belgium, still is, I think in many countries. You follow that training as a big nice school with <laughs> brand new computers, and everyone in the first ten nights is eager to learn the computer. And in the back, they put the blind, the deaf, and everyone else that doesn't fit in the general. And they follow the lesson that they gave up after three lessons. So this was something a comment that we heard. Secondly, another element that they also said was the kind of support that would be during the lesson would be very, very important. And there we talk about mentoring, so that there is a, a person of confidence that they can approach. We also talk there <coughs> about peer support, because what we have seen is a person with disability that acquires skills is very eager to teach to others. Well, and Steve, a very good example. Whatever they learn to teach to others. I've seen this also happening in, uh, in Greece, where is Panayotis here? Yes, I attended uh, one of the sessions a few weeks ago in Greece, I saw it after Greece. People help each other, that's peer support in the So the idea was what can we do with that? With uh, the fact that we know that there is a gap, what can we do? So, with a number of people present here in the room, we started writing proposals that fitted the idea. Next, one of the other elements we saw was Okay, this is technology, it's all fine, but the people with disabilities themselves do not know what exists. I mean, they don't even know the big picture. That's stand alone, even knowing the specific problem. So there was another gap that we had. So we put again the, the heads together in a number of countries, and we came up with another proposal. Another element, because we, we went further and further into giving skills to people with disabilities and also going further and further and realizing <coughs> by giving them skills, we can also increase their chance for employment. And there was a very bright professor from Bulgaria who approached and said, but what about social skills? And we came up with another proposal that addressed social skills. So in the end, and that's also what we're going to address this afternoon. There are a wide array of projects that provide, on the one hand, uh, useful curriculums, training content, application, games, etc., that can help address all these areas. And important, I think, they are all for free. We have, and I, if, if I could kindly ask all the ones that are addressing these projects, could you stand up? So I will first ask, yes, uh, Atlek to stand up. Yes, sit down again. <laughs> Vicky to stand up. Say hello to everyone. Hello, sit down again. Imagine to stand up. One of them. Dice to stand up. I'm one of them. Um, SGACC to stand up. <laughs> so what do I mean with this? I don't want to say that we are meeting projects by the minute. This is not the case. What I want to, to say this is, we are a bunch of people that work with people with disabilities, that identify the needs, and we believe that we create projects that create the results that are useful for everyone. I would also like to emphasize that all the results that we create in every one of these projects is totally free. People pay taxes, we are happy to be able to use the taxes, but we are even more happy to give it all back, in terms of very good outcomes. Okay? This is also the case in any of the future uh, projects that we are working on. I'm sure in two years time we'll have a very nice presentation on educational robots. Um, but the idea every time is the same. We do it with taxpayers' money and give the free back to, to the people that pay the taxes. This is, in a nutshell, for you to understand the previous presentation once you are back at home. So I'm not going to repeat this. There are just some additional uh, projects mentioned. What you're going to see in this integrated uh, presentation is first to understand the aims of the Ferris, Ferris project, to understand the involvement of the people with disabilities, because I think it's very important. Why we adopt blended games, and the, the expert on educa education gaming is sitting here, David. The approach to the creation of the user to curriculum. You will see this also coming back in the presentation by Evert Jan. <coughs> we follow a similar approach. How to use a product 
project results, and then the importance of mentors and peer supports in all of this. <coughs> this I already addressed, I just skipped it for completion. Now, this I would like to just say a few things about. It. When we work in the, the, the projects, none of us is luggage. What do we mean by that? None of the people involved in the project participate just because they want to have a the project to connect somewhere. We have an intention when we bring people together, they have skills, and they have skills that you want to use because they are for the benefit of people in this campus. That also means that in all the steps that we undertake within the project, we are involved in people in this For example, Steve, Wim, and Daniel can uh, testify to that. They have been involved in all these steps. So first of all, is collecting the user requirements. <coughs> you write a proposal. Right, you have to find a big idea what the, what the project is going to do. But apart from that, there are a number of things that you really need to ask also the end user. Or there are other things they want. This will be maybe when we wrote the proposal, this will not understand the needs correctly. So from the very beginning, when we collect the user requirements, we have the people this is involved. Next, implementation and testing. What do I mean with that? We develop something, we feed it back, and we ask from the end user to provide the and this avoids that after two years we we'll come up with something that the end user says, mm, what is this? Guys, you have to turn back. Third element is validation. And the validation there, I mean the party. So we have end users in the different countries all over Europe, <coughs> assessing what we have created and providing the feedback. And then last but not least, exploitation. And I would like to say one, uh, a few words about this. Exploitation in our vision is not about making money. Exploitation is by looking at are the things that we have created in the project, are they being used? Because it's exploitation. It's going back to the service providers, going back to end user organizations and see that they're being used. That's also the reason why many people in our projects talk in different countries with different people also to introduce the work that we are doing. This is just a snapshot of some of uh, the, the meetings that we had with the various end users. So, if you see the faced out faces, it's because we respect the confidentiality. And the first project that will be uh, explained in detail is VIPI. This was originally called Virgin. But then we got a very nice couple of emails from the Virgin company, which meant that after six months we had to renew, uh, rename this uh, project in VIPI. And uh, David Brown, and not from Chuck University is coordinator of this project. So I give the floor now to Okay, thank you, Carl. Okay, first of all, I would like to cover why we think games might be important for education. So recently, the value in terms of education of computer games and video games has come to the fore. Earlier work on games tend to focus on the really negative aspects. These were people in the 80s called LG and Myers. Also, this has been picked up by people like Williamson in the UK, saying that games, although being part of popular culture, may be seen as being culturally degenerative. Okay, so we have these kind of conflicting opinions about how valuable games are. People say that play in games, people like Mayor Pivik say that playing games are particularly important in early learning. But as education moves to more formal context, there seem to be a serious activity. But more recently, the positive aspects led by people like Penny Standen in intellectual disability. Four of games for people with intellectual disability have been key, begin to be seen such as improving choice reaction time, independent decision work making, working memory, and math skills. And that not only includes commercially available games, but serious games which have the same commercial um, values um, and production values as commercial games, but have, other than a purely <coughs> entertainment focus, they're meant to be teach something. Why are games important for people with disabilities? First of all, it might be the ability of games to engage the learner voluntarily, and that's really important, voluntarily, with sufficient repetitions to ensure that learning takes place. This is what Garris terms persistent re-engagement. The learner returns to the task and prompted. 
And there's also this kind of immediate coupling between the immediate feedback in the game, the activity, linked to a learning outcome. It's easy for the user to understand that their action has produced a learning outcome. It's immediate. I also want to say, if anybody wants to think I'm saying anything controversial, or just say anything, ask me a question as we're going along. It's more fun that way. Okay, also in terms of mobile learning too. <coughs> The significance of this particular um, technology is really the status it holds with their peers. And that's particularly important for people with disabilities. Even if they have vision problems or manual dexterity problems, these, these technologies are already part of mainstream and special needs classrooms already. So some of the first applications in education were prompting individuals with autism to complete everyday tasks. And this was a part of a program to improve employability, <coughs> um, developing an iPhone app, which was used by trainers to send cues on fire safety to iPods for people with autism. And this received incredibly good satisfaction ratings from the students, but also crucially from their families too. Really important is that mobile technology supports learning in the context in which it will be applied. So this is really important for target users who are described in terms of intellectual disability as concrete thinkers. That means their thinking is rigid, that it's hard to apply to other situations, that it's rule-based following and it's context dependent. So if you can teach somebody with an intellectual disability in the context to which they should be applying that learning, that's very important. So moving the learning to a real-time, real-world context is going to be very important for our target audiences with poor memory skills. And also we must recognise the social dimension of learning, where that users can voluntarily help each other work cooperatively, but if you're in a special school like David, you can take mobile phones home and you can include your older brothers and sisters and your teachers, not your teachers, your parents and caregivers. And that's really important too. Everybody agree with that? Any comments to offer? No? Okay, so what are the aims of the MIPI project? First of all, we want to create accessible and flexible ICT skills training designed to meet the specific, real, practical needs of people with disabilities and their trainers. The project outcomes are designed for people with disabilities to acquire these practical skills, but the trainers and facilitators themselves must be willing to introduce user-centered and user-orientated approach into classrooms. We also have a range of secondary target audiences, including disability <coughs> officers, training departments, supported employment and pre-vocational projects, daycare centers, and bodies providing services and counselling for people <coughs> with disabilities. So, what does VIPI have? And if you're interested in training, this is important. It has a curriculum, it has content, it has a series of online games, desktop games, and it also has uh, mobile games too. It combines face-to-face -face learning for the delivery of ICT training via an e-learning platform. And I think Paniotis is going to talk about that later on. The curriculum itself is differentiated into three levels. We're dealing with a very, I don't know if this is controversial to say, but a very heterogeneous population, ranging from severe intellectual disability through to physical disability. So we need to differentiate the curriculum. Unit one is the most basic level for complete beginner, beginners. It deals with parts of a computer, different types of a computer, input and output devices, as well as operating basically with Windows operating system. I think I just saw somebody on the 12 minute rule, but it turned to the two minute rule. And also, unit two adds further detail dealing with specific packages of creating documents, spreadsheets, email, using the internet, and being safe online. Unit three is more complex, it adds a more detailed approach, it develops uses specific packages to, to teach um, email, um, being safe online, but also creating documents and presentations and spreadsheets. Flexibly, it allows the identification <coughs> of appropriate entry levels 
for all those users of massively different abilities so that you can navigate it very differently and create personalized learning pathways. So this allows us, with any game, to balance challenge with a degree of possibility of success and progress. It can be navigated in lots of different ways. So we use it with additional <coughs> components. The additional components are the learning objects, <coughs> the curriculum, the content, and the ability, especially in Bippy, to create and add new games and resources. So we've been involved at the Oakfield School and with Carl in lots of projects to develop games for people with intellectual dis disability. So we have the Gold Project, the Game On Project, the Go Project. <laughs> Let, I was going to say, let's not forget which projects we have, which is today. <laughs> let's make sure that these projects don't stand on the shelf and are never used again. Let's bring them in and create learning objects out of them so that everybody can get these resources. But we also have all the products of Vipi are completely accessible and can be transferred to other accessible formats. So that means that includes accessible PDFs, it includes Daisy audiobooks that we were talking about before, and it also includes um, other objects. Um, so if you give me another example of what I'm looking for. It could be online uh, references. Online references, thank you. Witness accounts. Witness accounts. Brilliant. However, how do we introduce this into an established, how would I introduce this into a, a daycare centre? You give somebody a curriculum, you give them the content, and you say, here's a piece of technology, you can deliver it in a mobile environment, you can deliver it in a desktop environment, I give it to somebody like David, and they're going to say, how, what the hell are we going to do with this? So what we decided to do is to have a very blended educational and pedagogical framework. That just means it's a blueprint of how to optimally introduce Bippy into an established education and training setting to give some guidance but in a very flexible way. So we know <coughs> dealing with this heterogeneous population, our trainees will vary massively in their needs and abilities. So we just can't expect this to be prescriptive. We also know tra trainers, people like Jane and Tom, will need lots of guidance about how to introduce Bippy. We can't just simply introduce it to them. It might require teachers and trainers to take a radically different pedagogical <coughs> approach to learning with these e-learning platforms than a more traditional educational paradigm. And we need to give support for that. So Penny Standard, Professor Penny Standard, is Professor of Intellectual <coughs> Disability at Nottingham, has come up with a framework which provides <coughs> dimensions which can generate directives and questions. And these are based on Minosha's um, four dimensions. The first is social, and these are issues related to collaboration and group working. So an example directive here might be that we know that students should be encouraged to engage in social activities. We know that lots of people with disabilities tend to be isolated. We can use Bippy's resources to encourage people to collaborate and meet up, whilst recognising that some of our cohorts, some of our users, might want that face-to-face -face and learning all of the time. Educational, these are factors to do with which have a bearing on learning and teaching. One of the questions we came up here with Penny is, can some of the peers act as tutors? This is what Carl saw a lot in his case studies in Belgium, people suddenly developed self-confidence and they started to mentor the learning activities of other people in the group. This happened in the nicer group too. That develops not only their self-confidence, but the confidence of the whole group. Organizational skill, organizations, and this is where if you're introducing any new radical technological intervention into schools that I know, this is where we meet most resistance. <coughs> Sarah, where are you in the audience? This is what you said to you. You asked me the question, this school or this training centre doesn't want to introduce these new types of learning. What do I say to them? All I said was, that's what we found out too. That's the biggest barrier to introduction of new advanced pedagogy in schools with accompanying training materials. So, the institution itself must be forward-looking 
and it must have appropriate support for a, a different and more complementary pedagogical approach. One of the questions Penny came up with here is, what is the optimal ratio of trainers to trainees? I might swap that around and say, what is the most economic ratio of trainers to trainees? That's what lots of teachers say to us. Last is technological factors, and these are factors related to access, implementation, and maintenance of tools and services. So is there sufficient technological support to, for us to introduce FIPI into a school? And this might be, um, a, a directive here would be, ensure there is correct support, because otherwise your learners are going to be massively demotivated. So, what did we do in piloting? We took a research question. Does VIPI improve the basic ICT skills in people with disabilities? Primary aim of the project, that should be our research question. The materials we tested was the curriculum, the content, the games, and the platform. The data we collected with consent for each participation, uh, um, each participant included age, gender, and disability. We used three tools. The first was the Competencies and Skills Progress Rating, radar. This recorded changes over baseline measures. We took baseline measures of 12 dimensions, including their ability with ICT, their confidence in interacting with ICT, literacy, numeracy, timekeeping, some other ones, there's 12 of them. My memory's plus or minus uh, two. And we recorded them at the beginning before we introduced Vipi in the number of sessions we had in piloting. We then, this was self-assessment, but we recorded it at some points along the way, multiple baseline measures, and at the end too. We also had an observational checklist, which systematically recorded and identified the remaining usability and accessibility issues with using Vipi, so that we could still close down these issues at a re relatively late summative stage in the project. And we had a questionnaire at the end, post emotion, to say to the students, did you find the content, the curriculum, the e-learning platform effective for your particular use? They are the piloting sites, not too much to say about that, all lasted from May to October. But the interesting thing is, in Belgium, in um, the UK, and in Lithuania, we were using mainly Unit 1, people with intellectual disabilities, therefore the very basic unit. In the other countries, they tended to look at people with physical disabilities, sensory impairments, so they look at Unit 2 and Unit 3. It's a differentiated curriculum, aiming at different um, ranges of disability, therefore that's appropriate. Pilot results. We tested with 17 participants at the Oakfield School, led by David and Sarah uh, and in terms of ICT, but the other um, teachers here. So we had 15 participants in Key Stage 5, 16 to 19 years old, with severe to moderate intellectual disability. Participation was voluntary, up to four sessions, with consent, up to one hour per session. In Belgium, we had 20 <coughs> trainees, six teachers. These were mostly in sheltered workshop schemes, which is the subject of Carl's video, with moderate to severe learning intellectual disabilities. These were bi-weekly bi -weekly sessions, lasting 50 <coughs> minutes each, and up to three um, sessions per day, combined with lunch. Very important. Headline results. VIPI enabled retention of ICT-based information between sessions. It increased measures of engagement. For me, that's the most important thing for intellectual disability, because the Complex Learning Disabilities and Difficulties Project in the UK, a research coming out of that, which David Stewart was involved with, said, without engagement for people with intellectual disability, there will be no meaningful learning or outcome. So engagement is, doesn't guarantee learning, deep learning, but it's a gateway to learning. We identified the barriers to the use of ICT and methods to overcome these, and also we improved the evaluation methods by participating with the teachers as we invite. 
The skills radar was self-assessment. It was too difficult for people with severe intellectual disability. So we changed it to something by the teachers, by by um, Tom, I think we're involved with that. Yes, stop using his mobile phone when you talk. It's like being in lectures again. <laughs> <laughs> and we came up with a much better, better measure. That's an outcome <coughs> for project two. Tell us why university researchers